you everybody for coming uh, this morning to the Words Festival. Heart warmed, heart warmed to see everybody here for, uh, for our session. I'm going to introduce today's uh, moderator and interviewer and then I'm going to turn it over. Uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator for our talk today, Dennis Garnum, the new artistic director of the Grand Theatre. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I was just mentioning to Dennis that there was a wonderful session that the Grand Theatre held uh, just this, uh, a couple, I think it was a month ago, and I had a chance to hear Dennis speak about his new vision for the Grand Theatre, and I was energized in my seat, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to take place with theatre in London, Ontario. It's a very exciting time for us. Uh, Dennis comes to us from Theatre Calgary, where he was the artistic director since 2005. Relocating to London is a, a coming home for Dennis, who grew up here. His theatre career began at the Grand Theatre with a role at Antler River at the age of 13. That's uh, a prodigy at the age of 13. <laughs> Later, he was an usher, stage manager, and eventually in 2004, he and his husband, Ruth uh, Shellery, am I saying that right? Celery? Celery. Celery, also from London, married in the balcony of the Grand. Beyond theater... <laughs> Beyond theater Calgary, Dennis has directed plays, musicals, and operas at companies across the country and internationally, including Florida Grand Opera, Vancouver Opera, National Arts Centre, Shaw Festival, Stratford Festival, Tarragon Theatre, and a number of co-productions, including Major Barbara with American Conservatory of Theatre in San Francisco. Please welcome Dennis Garnum and our panel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a, truly an honor to be here. I was asked to do this before I even got the job, before I even started the job. And I knew that being coming to the Museum of London, and uh, it, well, I'm starstruck by these two fellows, so that's actually why I said yes. Um, so I've been in the job for four weeks, um, and um, uh, I remember sleeping in September. That was a nice month when I slept. <laughs> um, but what I want to, uh, what I want to, uh, I'm a theater director. That's what I do for a living. I'm not an author. I, I, well, I have published books, I guess I am an author. Uh, but uh, my, my focus for the next 45 minutes uh, today with these two jets will be from the theater point of view. I, I really want to know and explore your creativity from that angle. If what we'll go into their bios on my left or down at Clark, and by far, far, far left, Robert Chase. These are two great outstanding uh, writers whose um, the, the um, complexity of what they've written. We've got, we have po their poetry, their prose, their plays, their operas, um, their acting. It's pretty extraordinary the things that they have done. So pulling on that as a theme, um, I want, I want to, I'll, I'll give you a hint of where we're going to go. Okay. Three, there's, three, there's three areas. We're going to go really big, and we're going to go national and political first. Big world order. Then we're going to get personal. You're going to make the audience cry a little bit with your truth. And then you're going to um, help me at the Grand Theatre, because I'm very interested about whether we should be doing new plays at the Grand. And so you're going to help me figure out the <laughs> <laughs> right. That's my politics. So first of all, uh, I am very curious, and I'll start with you, Robert. Um, um, uh, but the question will be for both of you, which is, a big part of your identity in your writing has to do with representing part of this country. My question is, how is that to wear on? Why do you do that? Are you tired of that? What's that responsibility? And, I, uh, and so, over to Mr. Newman. <laughs> Captain, Captain Newman. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I'll take you far back. I'll, I'll take you back to uh, when I first started writing plays, uh, I guess 1991 or so. Um, I didn't know very much. And I think I can, all can say that when I first started writing. I really didn't know very much. And I knew that uh, I had a mission, and I knew that I wanted my work to uh, exist outside of, and be produced outside of the And so I thought that what that meant was to make the work as universal as possible. And so I did everything in my person, my being, to rid the work of place names, of surnames that were identified in the land that would uh, lock the work into being only in the land. 
And then, uh, despite that uh, intent, um, I was working on a show in Calgary, actually, in Lunchbox Theatre's Theatre in 1996, 97. And uh, she and all the actors at the table turned and said, well, you're in a carnival sense of place in your work. And I had no idea what you were talking about. I was just going to nod and hear it. Very I had no idea what she was talking about. A uh, couple years after that, I was uh, I was commissioned to write a play for a company in New Prime Harbor called Theater New Prime Labrador, but I called it New Province, which eventually came here and spotted the world's in the country. And um, that play was, when I was commissioned to write that play, they said specifically, you know, the grand dream for that play was that it was successful, the tour to the old age home scene from the end. That was the grand dream. And, and they said, you know, this was about a, a woman who had died in 1990 at the age of 100, with kind of here on the western coast of Ukraine, and was very well known for certain generations of writers. And so the idea was to make this play for him. And so I, I made it as specific to that area as possible. And it became a big hit at the festival there. And then we, my company, wanted to bring to St. John's. And we actually had a very serious discussion with some of the will this play actually work at St. John's? It's so specific to the west coast of Ukraine. And then I kind of worked there, and then I traveled to Ottawa the same questions kept coming up. And eventually traveled over the UK and Australia. And uh, I still kind of, you know, years into this, I was mystified as to why this was working. Of course, I eventually discovered that what makes place, what makes work here was sort of specificity and, and cultural regional specificity actually more specific to make something the more uh, universal uh, it can be. Um, so in the, in the aftermath of that, I kind of became the uh, artificial biographer of my legends, a lot of the plays that were written have been about true of my stories or adaptations of my novels. Um, I wear that mantle proudly, in, in a way, in that uh, I think there are a lot of stories here that certainly in the national context we, we don't know. Um, I, I, you know, every now and then I, I get a little spike, you know, when I do something really experimental, I want to I kind of shake off that mantle of being the good kind of Puritan boy in the front theater or something. Um, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. Andy Jones talks about uh, Andy Jones with Todd Cope, uh, talks about uh, every time he's a bit on the shows so that you know when he goes on stage, uh, this idea that when he's about to speak, his first line on stage, that Joey Smallwood's in his mind going, "Represent us well, Andy." Don't let us down. <laughs> uh, and there is there is an aspect to that. There is an aspect. One of the worst reviews I, I ever got in my life. I actually did this review at one time to cut me away from it. Uh, you know, call me for my parents' review was your I forgot what city was in, but uh, for a lot of water uh, this reviewer essentially said, uh, you know, only my characters, who cares? Ouch, right? And um, that was probably the most devastating thing to hear because it really hit home to that part of me that felt like I was representing a misunderstood culture. So, so what would Joey Smallwood think about what would it say about a play you wrote about him called? The call here on the Code of Dreams. Coming well, where? First of all, where? Coming to the Grand Theater of the Evil Yeah. The Evil Tables is the Evil Tables. Yeah. 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 Yeah
possibly here, but was here in an interview with somebody, and the interviewer actually said, you know, seeing your Toyota story is the first time I've heard you by an accent, and it wasn't supposed to be funny. And I thought, wow, I guess there's still some work to do. You know? um, and several times with viewers over the years, have you ever tended to know the TV comedy? That's what all this is for me. It's like, ouch. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I, I wear that back proudly. I don't, I'm certainly not the only one doing it. Um, I guess in theater, uh, I'm, I'm the most notable name doing that kind of work. Um, but there are, are a lot of, certainly our literary communities, you know, Michael Carney, who's in more, Michael Winkle and Johnson are, 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 are kind of the uh, vanguards of what you're doing out of that, people in Arizona. Right. So tell me a little more about um, Colony and what was it like to adapt? You've written you know, mostly original work, but here's a, a novel and you put it on stage. What was that like for you? And, and what, what is different about it than the novel? Well, it's, uh, for those of you who know the novel, it's, it's huge, you know, and it takes uh, the stories of Smallwood's life from essentially when he's about 13 years old to his den. Um, most of it focuses not on his, his political aspirations from his new teens up until uh, about 10 years into his tenure as being my premier, but the bulk of it, of course, being the lead out to the in Canada. And the thing that I was most, uh, you know, it's not a book when you read it, it's not a book you go, wow, this has to be a play. <laughs> In fact, it actually, you should have a car or don't make it some play. <laughs> it's a good play, though, trust me. Uh, come see it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's an epic, you know, it's a uh, poem. And, it, um, and so digging into it, I, I, the first thing I, I realized is that's two tracks that I was really interested in. It has this track of Smallwood, um, you know, he went off to New York. Was uh, working with the Socialist Party of New York. He has this long history there, and that's when he first heard the book. But I was really interested in his kind of power within the point. Coming back from, from New York, literally rags, uh, destitute by having this great political ambition and eventually becoming our first premier. I wanted to tell that story. And I also wanted to tell this side of the story, of course, of the feeling and the way Johnston has crafted her as uh, kind of these big turns that small work has in his life. And it's politics with the big term, true story. Uh, you know, that, that Johnson kind of very carefully leads the story of Sheila Fielding next to him and promoting him, that a lot of these big terms in decision making that Smallwood has, Johnson links to her input and her presence and what she's done to him. Uh, so I was very interested in that. So the, the show that results is a uh, kind of stop the star failed romance. Um, it, you know, it, it's still epic, it still travels over 20 or 30 years, but it really is connects to a uh, man trying to gain political power and a woman standing in his way. I'm not touching that. The, um, uh, I've seen the images of the production, I haven't seen the production, but it's also really quite stunning. You and Jillian Kylie obviously working very closely together. And it's going to be very interesting to presenting it at the Grand in 2015, which is a year celebration. So I think that's going to add another color to the George, Damn so uh, you've done a few things in your writing career, but I want to take this way, way, way back and tell you something that happened to me when I first met you, which is uh, Beatrice Jensen. There was this play that he wrote, which was turned into contemporary opera, and it was in Toronto. This is, I think, 30 years ago, and I remember going and being told to go. It wasn't something that was Obvious, but somebody told me I need to go, and I was upstairs in a very tiny room in the round uh, where you could touch the singers as they sang. And this woman started it. What was her name? Misha. Misha Rubin Motherfucker. She was a famous opera singer now. Was, and I remember her singing this stuff, crawling on the floor, sweating, and you know, just really blowing my mind on what a contemporary opera about a Canadian story could be. And so how did that all happen? And what, how is that, and she's obviously gone on to write this, she should be written in anything. Where does that sit? And you know, that was uh, in the East Coast, and that was a very particular world you wanted to talk about, right? Uh, thanks so much, Dennis. Uh, very quickly, uh, Beatrice Chancy is based on the true story of the Italian noblewoman, Beatrice Cenci, uh, who was executed in Rome on September 11, 1599, 
uh, for the crime of parasite. She had arranged the murder of her atrocious, tyrannical father, Francesco. Uh, and the poet Shelley uh, wrote a fantastic uh, play about that historical incident where he imagines that uh, Beatrice's impetus for arranging the murder of her father was that, she, was that uh, he had raped her. Um, and and uh, so he alleges this, and there isn't much place, basis for that allegation in history, but it is certainly true that Francesco Cenci was a horrible man. Anyway, in studying for my comprehensive examination in English literature for the PhD at Queen's University in 1992, um, and while I was very interested and intrigued and thrilled by all the great canonical writing John Milton, Shakespeare, William Blake, Wordsworth, and so on and so forth, Tennyson even, uh, and, and so on. I was mainly captivated by, by this play, which stands alone in Shelley's work. If you read Shelley, Shelley is a play of political liberation, of, of fantasy, uh, Queen Mab is one of his um, most famous productions, of course, and, and hymns to intellectual beauty, a very, uh, uh, no pun intended, airy-fairy kind of, of writer uh, in, terms of, in terms of his grasping for the ineffable and arguing for uh, what, is, um, uh, what exists only in, in fantasy or imagination uh, or dream, uh, for that matter. But uh, his uh, play, The Chenchi, is, is again unique in his oeuvre because in that play, he actually talks about blood and tears, and sweat, and poison, and gold, and murder, and rape. And he uses these words over and over and over again. It's the most concrete thing that Shelley ever wrote. So when I, when I read it, uh, I was captivated by it and knew I was going to write my own version of it. And uh, out of the blue, uh, James Rolfe, a uh, great composer, uh, wrote to me and asked if I could write him a libretto. And I told him the story of the Chenchi, and he said, yes, that's it, because he wanted to have an opera that would involve uh, people sweating and, and notions of illicit intercourse um, and torture scenes and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I wrote uh, uh, Beatrice uh, Chansey, uh, and I said it in Nova Scotia in 1801 during slavery. Uh, slavery still existed historically, and it, and it existed in uh, uh, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, uh, Quebec, and Ontario. Uh, uh, back in the uh, 18th century, and in the beginning of Quebec in the 17th century, actually, when, when it was then New France. But anyway, I wanted to write a play that would talk about uh, slavery, so I used this Italian Renaissance crime story as the basis for my story, uh, Beatrice Chancy, who uh, essentially is raped by her father, who is also her master, uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, she directly murders him in association with her lover, who is also a slave, whose name is Led. Uh, and and uh, so that's the basic plot of the, of, the, of the story. It did become an opera, as composed by James Rolfe, and, and um, had four productions uh, 18 years ago, 18 and, and uh, 17 years ago, uh, and 16 years ago and 15 years ago, uh, not 30 years ago, uh, and, and, uh, and was the first Canadian opera in 30 years, actually it was the first Canadian opera in 30 years to be shown on CBC television. So there was a little bit of a, of a, of a note uh, for that, or notoriety as close attached to that. Um, and I should uh, uh, read a little tiny uh, section of the, of the play, and this is uh, Beatrice's speech of self-defense. Uh, of course, uh, she is arrested uh, for her crime, and, and uh, she gives this speech just before uh, she is taken out to be executed along with her uh, stepmother, and, and of course, um, well, just she and her stepmother. So here it is. Uh, it's Act 5, Scene 2, and I forgot to say, it's a tragic drama. So everybody dies at the end, uh, in the usual classical way. So Beatrice says, I pinned a viper's eye to something that hurt. His blood gusted across my palm. I stuck a coffin smack in his neck. Consider that I was never free, never safe from an invoice of shame. 
My heart cracked open, and there was only extinction. That night, fusillades of rain smashed French horns. That night, horses wickered in the murk. That night, five months passed, I was deadly as a church. I grubbed raw the New Testament weeping, the Old Testament praying. I cut him two gashes, and he bled like a butcher. White men, you took away my freedom and gave me religion. So be it, I became a devout killer. Uh, and if I can follow up very quickly, uh, because we started off talking about the nation and the political and so on, and, and currently I'm uh, serving as the Parliamentary Poet Laureate, or Poet Laureate of the Canada. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, last month I got into the, into the news by mentioning that MPs had not been asking me to write poems uh, uh, for them. And I think, and, and it was big mainly because of the fact they never really thought of it. I mean, they created the position of Poet Laureate, then they put it on autopilot. Uh, and didn't realize that, that, you know, there was somebody there, yes, with a small honorarium, so it's not like it's a day job or anything, but, but uh, you know, it is in my job description that I was supposed to write poetry for uh, 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 serious occasions or, and so on, but in order to do that, uh, at least on a parliamentary uh, scale, one might want to be asked by a member of parliament to do something, <laughs> or by a senator. So once that news got out there, I started to receive actually invitations to write poems, which is very nice. And so I'm going to read this one, which was requested by uh, Irene Matheson, uh, who's an uh, MP for London. And uh, it's going to be in her householder, the, the uh, uh, publication is distributed through the household to all the households in the, in the constituency. And so the poem is titled, No Second London. Uh, no apologies to William Butler Yeats and his No Second Troy. It's a slightly different poem, but anyway, No Second London. Ontario's London isn't second, but prime for its clean air and clear Thames. However, beauty's neatly reckoned via pale architecture of blossoms, or neighborhoods that thrive as nurseries, or extremities that harbor dreams, fruit of universities science sorceries, or John Robart's visionary statute to imagine a province of students and a city of commerce, culture, and law, and agriculture that rewards prudence, erecting harvests that Shakespeare foresaw. There is a first London, but this one isn't second, being less dour and thus more pleasant. <laughs> I didn't explain to you that I, the real interest I had with sitting here today was I have a lot of work to do and I could just do it in front of you all. I have to do these guys anyways, but you can watch. So we're working up very well. So let's get personal for a second, um, uh, or two. Robert, your work, personal, not personal. Rumor has it, it's very, very personal. It's personal. Okay. What, what happens if I say two words? Loneliness. <laughs> and mother. Mother, that's interesting. My mother's a force of nature, and a very peculiar woman. My mother has this thing uh, where she, uh, my father was, was quite ill recently, and he's fine, uh, we think, but uh, he had a, a bad out of health recently. And my mother is a very anxious person, and all of me and my brothers, we've all uh, inherited that. Um, that kind of is all I think I feel that out with the rest of my family. But my, my mother, um, you know, she she will stress about, she's totally a, a ball of nerves all the time. I'm telling my dad how to do this. So, you know, this summer my dad was going golfing with some friends, and mom had to stay in the house by herself, so she called me up, can you come stay with me for the weekend? Because I don't want to be alone. Sure, so I can't stay with her. And then my dad was in the hospital for a week, and I drove her home and said, I'm not going to stay with her. No, 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 no. It's like when things are really bad, something energizes in her, like her aura engages, like she's the, her maternal energy um, to protect overrides any kind of anxiety. It's a very strange thing. That's my mother. Uh, I guess I read a lot about her and dad, that any, any kind of character, any kind of character is of a certain age, I base it on. So she's, she's in your writing. She's in my writing. Yeah. 
She's in my writing a lot, yeah. Um, and so is my dad. My dad is there a lot, and my brothers, and uh, anyone that comes anywhere close to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of personal, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how else to write. It's really interesting to go down this road of, of uh, and I didn't understand quite uh, what I was doing for a long time, because I'm going down this road of writing existing narratives. And cause my, my first plays were very personal. And this book, this book of short stories is incredibly personal. What is this book called? It's called Two Man Tent. It is, how many books have you written? Uh, this is the first book of fiction. This is the first thing I wrote. When did it come out? It just came out like two weeks ago. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. 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 So that, that's really personal, I guess, in, in terms of a, a, so there's, a, there's a level of uh, personal uh, display uh, I'm having in this book that hasn't really happened anywhere else where actually previously my numbers were taking my life and put them in, I usually attribute to a character, but I'm actually the character in this book in four sections of this book. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't quite know when I went to do the, the work that was based on how people are or um, the adaptations of existing works. Um, I, I kind of foolishly thought that I wasn't in that work for a long time. I thought uh, I wasn't in that work. I didn't have to be in that work. Um, and I talked a little bit about this last night. You know, my dear friend who passed away a month ago, Iris Turkoff, who was my German for many years, uh, who was sure George she was well, and famous, obviously, new one. And can, uh, I get, can I jump into Iris Turk? So, really, the new legend in this country, the woman who yes. helped foster so many, many, many plays. Or that's correct. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I don't get to talk to her, but to say that she's she her her the type of work she did as a director is completely behind the scenes. On top of that, as a as a woman, she was very focused on the art and not at all on credit. There was one famous example where uh, a playwright's uh, work that she'd been working on for four years when it went to the stage. Iris' name wasn't on the program, and Iris kind of laughed it off as a joke that she'd been working on this piece for four years. Uh, and the, the playwright's parents actually wanted to pay the theater to do a reprint of the program because they were so angry that Iris, uh, who did so well, this work wasn't acknowledged. But Iris didn't care about that stuff. So, because she didn't care about that stuff, I think she's one of the most important figures in Canadian theater in the last 30 years, but so few people outside of the theater actually know who she was. Uh, but Iris, when I was working at Wild Water, uh, that was a story that I, you know, narrative that I told many people over the years. I wanted to, I wanted to do something with that. I was going to do a movie first, and, and I would talk to you about the narrative. Every time I tell that story about the narrative, I was going to break down and cry. It's something about the story that you cry. And I was two or three drafts in the way in that way. And finally, I was stabbing one day in your typical artist way. You know, why, why, why do you write this play? Every time you tell someone about the story, you cry. It's not the play. You need to figure out your personal connection to this work, which you never occurred to me that I would have to do that. And then and when I can you it, would you stop there for a second? Sure. Because we're theater director. Can you now act that out how it actually transpired? It's you need to know what the virus is actually like. Here. Well, this is weird. There's a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I probably, I probably can't. Um, yeah, any encounter with virus is all a story. But it would be loud. It would, it would be, be very loud. loud. She, she had a voice kind of, she talks like a puppet. She kind of talked like this. She had wild blonde hair. And I can't talk too much about virus. I'm upset. I really like she was an incredibly important person in the end. I don't quite know what I'm going to do with Mary now that she's passed. I'm serious about that. I'm very kind of soul searching right now in terms of where, how, how I move forward because my process has been so grounded in her for the last 10 years. But she said that, and, and in that moment, I realized that I was in this work somehow. I had to be. And then I realized that the lead character of Bob, for those of you who saw the show, was here. The lead character of Bob wasn't a mother. I mean, you probably heard me just talk about just that's, that's the lead character of Bob. Harsh very loving woman, and her relationship with her husband John, that's mom and dad. And that uh, my grandmother, how my grandmother, uh, as a rural commander of that generation, uh, would talk about language she used around uh, cultures that weren't her home, would be quite appalling if you just kind of stumble upon it. She didn't know the vernacular, she didn't know the words, but she would also, uh, regardless of who you were, open her home to you, take care of you, feed you. Uh, she had a hateful bone in her body. And so there's something about that that innocence uh, in that that innocence and altruism that that uh, that generation of people I live in, particularly my grandmother, that kind of opened up the mirror story and when I realized it was about that that began to start to really cook. Um, so yeah, all the work, short answer, all the work is very personal. I think it has to be, otherwise it falls.
fault, but if I can't find my way in personally, uh, there's, there's no hope for it. Fantastic. Which leads me to George's new book, The More Cyclist, a novel. And who's this all about? Uh, Dennis, thanks. Uh, this novel is based on my late father's 1959 diary, um, which is the only thing he left to me when he passed away at the end of, of August uh, 2005. It took me a year to read the diary, uh, but once I read it, I realized that uh, here was somebody I hadn't really known, uh, because the man I knew was always very decisive, very sure of himself, uh, very assertive, uh, but the young man revealed in the diary, and back then he was uh, 23, 24, when he was keeping the diary, was someone who lacked a lot of confidence and was very uncertain, very unsure. Um, and I believe it's the only year he ever kept a diary, and it was a very important year because it's the year I was conceived. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I had a sense then by reading the diary of, of how he and my mother actually got together excuse me, and, 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 um, and all the various uh, uh, travails around that. And what was fascinating for me is, is that the diary revealed the situation for the black Nova Scotian community, which as everybody here knows, goes back uh, 200 years plus and is a landed community with uh, land and holdings all around mainland Nova Scotia and, and, uh, and so on. So uh, a very subtle culture uh, in many ways, and, and uh, a culture that was replenished, uh, of course, through natural processes of procreation and, and marriage uh, sometimes, uh, and so on. But by 1959, a very interesting situation had developed for uh, the African Nova Scotian, or to use my word, Africadian uh, community, which is class stratification. Up until 1949, everybody was basically poor, unless you were a minister, or very few uh, might be teachers, and so on. But generally, everybody was working class or lumpen proletariat, or simply poor, and and working as as uh, 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 for cheap wages, or or uh, simply uh, as maids, or as cooks, as cleaners, uh, day laborers, and so forth. But 1949, women were given the right. Black women finally achieved the right to become nurses. And, and what that meant was the coming of class stratification, so that now you had women who were on the verge of potentially entering the middle class for the first time in our community <coughs> history. Uh, and so then the question was, who would they marry uh, as they were going to enter the middle class? Were they going to marry husbands from uh, Africadia, black Nova Scotia, who would most likely not have much more than grade three or grade six uh, who would be uh, unskilled labor uh, for the most part, or would they uh, marry outside the community, in quotation marks, either uh, a, a West Indian uh, immigrant who began to arrive uh, in Canada, men began to arrive in Canada in 1955 because of, of the West Indian Domestic Scheme, which was the title of the program, which was enunciated by the federal government in 55 because of the fact that Canada was a signatory to the UN Charter uh, in establishing the UN, and it meant that we had to drop our racist uh, immigration laws, which began to be dropped in 1955. Uh, but for 50 years, there were anti-black immigration laws in Canada, 1905 to 55. But to fast forward uh, in the narrative here, by 1959, when my uh, character Carl, my protagonist, is beginning to think seriously about maybe settling down and starting a family, uh, and he's operating this big purple BMW that he calls Elizabeth II. Uh, uh, he's, he's thinking that uh, because he's handsome and dapper, he's got great ten. He should be instant, instantly uh, attractive to any number of black women, uh, and perhaps white women too. Uh, this is the beginning of the civil rights movement uh, in the United States, of course, but some of that also washes over into Nova Scotia and into Canada in general. Uh, in southwestern Ontario, of course, as well, especially Chatham uh, and London and, and uh, areas adjacent to these communities. Um, and, and he thinks he should be instantly attractive and, and potential spousal material for any number of, of women who might be enticed to take a ride on his BMW and then come back to his apartment 
uh, and, and which is very nicely appointed with the latest hi-fi and so on. And he's, and he's got a job, uh, a steady job at the railway, which is also uh, a point of, that makes him, uh, he believes, a, a meritorious uh, potential mate. Uh, but uh, it's 1959, and so what's happening is that some women he wants to date are going to become nurses and are going to become teachers, are going to enter the middle class, black women, and they may like to go out with him, but they may not want to actually marry him because now by this point, there are now West Indian students uh, who are going to become lawyers and doctors and engineers as well as professors of English and, and so on and so forth who are definitely going to be in the middle class, who already come from the middle class in Barbados and Trinidad and Jamaica, uh, uh, colonies that are, about to be, that are about to become independent. Um, and so these are also very attractive potential mates uh, for the same women that Carl wants to date. Uh, and, and if he says, oh, that's okay, I'll just go with the, with the, the maid or the, or the woman who works as a cleaner or what have you, who might have only grade three, even there, his desires are somewhat thwarted because of 1949. And not because of the fact that black women can become nurses, but because of the fact that NATO was created. And, and the creation of NATO in 1949 means that all of a sudden, you've got lots of African-American sailors coming to Halifax, who are also big time competition. In fact, in the, in the novel, I, I, uh, I joke that NATO, NATO really means, at least for Carl, NATO really means Negro Americans take over. Because <laughs> when they get to Halifax, and there's actually a photograph, there's a photograph in the, in the novel uh, that's an actual photograph of the visit of the aircraft carrier uh, USS Valley Forge to Halifax. And, and it's a, a, a photograph from 1959. It's an aerial photograph taken of the sailors on the deck of the aircraft carrier, these American sailors, spelling out two words. So there's 4,000 sailors on board this aircraft carrier, and they're spelling out the words, Hello, Halifax. <laughs> and they really meant it. So Carl has all kinds of competition, even with, even with uh, the maid that he's been dating, because all of a sudden, She's, she can go with all these African-American sailors. So no matter which way he turns, he's kind of thwarted, despite the fact that he believes he should be so attracted to everybody. Uh, I, won't, I won't give away the ending uh, and, and, and so on of the, of the novel. I, I'd like to say, to sum up, I'd like to describe it as, as a merger of Jane Austen and Jack Kerouac. Uh, because it's, it's, it's all about a, a young man in possession of a motorcycle must be in want of a wife. Uh, we can say that. And it's, and it's got a little bit of on-road um, uh, bed hopping going around, going on as well. Uh, so uh, it's a, it is, a, in essence, a comic novel, uh, which doesn't mean that every scene is, is humorous, but it does mean that it, it, it's on, uh, about courtship, ultimately. It's a novel about, about courtship. I see a stage play. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on both of those. So we're going to go to the last section that we will uh, uh, theory. We should do new work again at the Grand Theatre. That's a theory I have. Um, and I would love inspiration from a couple of guys from away to encourage or discourage that notion. Uh, you've said a bunch of things in the last 40 minutes that actually uh, I can take away with. Should we do new, Who cares? Why, why should we do new work in London, Ontario on our big stage? Who's going to come? Why do we care? You know, uh, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I, I will say that uh, where I come from, uh, and I would hazard to guess this is similarly in Quebec, that uh, it's actually a much harder sell to do uh, work that's not indigenous to the place. In uh, you know, a friend of mine was recently promoting the fact that he did a production of uh, The Jar Boy and couldn't get anyone to see it. <laughs> right, because no one knows who my company is there. Um, the audience is there really crave to hear and see themselves on stage. And that's the island mentality for sure. Um, you know, it's, uh, so that's, that's, that's where I grew up. I got, uh, all, of, all of my performing and writing arrows um, from most of my early career were Newfoundland and Spring Island community. Um, so it, it becomes a little bit difficult to talk about. Uh, and I know for those of you, if anyone saw my collaborator Joe Cloudy's presentation that she did here in May, uh, that it's very much about that. 
So maybe she should speak on this one. She has some great things to say about uh, fostering, uh, fostering love and stories and putting them on stage. I mean, I do think fundamentally, uh, sometimes, oh, this is going to sound so awful, I'm really sorry to say it. I think sometimes audiences uh, don't know what they need until you give it to them. But that's a dangerous thing, that's a dangerous thing as well uh, for people in our position of, of program power to think that we have all the answers as well. But I, I do believe that there's a, you know, I, I give the example, the FCC is a perfect example. For many, many years, under some tremendous ADs like Marty Merrill and people that came before her, that building was doing primarily work that was not convenient. Um, out of uh, a sense of filling that, that big cavernous theater and, and having people uh, in the theater and cater to the audience that, that was there. And then the uh, same thing with Canadian Stage in Toronto. Um, and then these uh, Mavericks who were out here, you know, Matthew Johnson in Toronto and uh, Peter Hinton at the NBC, who, along with the board of directors, people that were working with, took an incredible chance and watched the subscription series tank for a couple of years with the hope and goal to eventually build up an audience that was interested in progressive Canadian work. Uh, and, and in both cases, the audience is deeper down. The ABC is doing incredibly well now. Jill inherited a building, uh, inherited a, a series of an audience that she could program almost exclusively Canadian work to that was really unheard of 15 years before that. In large part because of the risks uh, and, and the challenges that Peter himself took on for the years he was there. And Matthew Johnson was well as seeing great return on that. So I think uh, I think it's worth it. I think that every every uh, region of the country, uh, I'm, I'm a proudly regionalist, but in my work, I, I think I think that uh, you know it's a great for Bill Hodge to talk about this as well. It's a great for Bill Hodge to teach about and he's kind of viewed in this country as, as a great internationalist, you know. There's this great thing where he talks about himself and shows how many even essentially regions playwrights and that I was saying earlier, regional and universal to great specificity. Uh, I think every region of Canada is going to have the stories on our stages. And if it's not going to be the grand type of stories of, of Southwest Ontario or London, or who else is it going to be? Here, here. Right? Well, it's sort of like back to the future, um, which is a good thing because I think that the greatest periods of artistic efflorescence in this country have been those periods of time when Canadians have actually embraced some notion of nationalism. And I think that nationalism is inherent in, in Quebec, given the whole history of la survivance against uh, Anglo-slash-American uh, oppression, uh, economic but also political. And, and, uh, and also Newfoundland, which of course has a history that goes back 500 years, uh, for crying out loud, and, and uh, uh, a grand history, uh, uh, also of survival and, and uh, battling with the elements. I mean, I think the key to Newfoundland culture is the Dictionary of Newfoundland English. The fact that we have a Dictionary of Newfoundland English that's, that's 500 pages long, like one page for each year of, of the former colony's existence. Uh, and and uh, so that that gives a sense that the liveliness of the language uh, itself is a key to, and the same thing for Quebec uh, drama uh, is a key to the uh, liveliness of of, of theater and theatrical theatrical conditions. If you have a language that is loved, a diction that is loved, uh, then it's quite possible to produce a great drama uh, out of that. But, and so I think that for the rest of Canada, the ROC, uh, we, need to, <laughs> we need to reinvest once again in notions of our English or our various versions of French and English and other languages for that matter. Uh, this is also a very highly ethnicized uh, nation. There's an, I think the most important map of Canada is the ethnic map of Canada because we have very distinctive communities in different parts of the country. And I've talked about the African Nova Scotian experience uh, but we can also talk about the Russian community in British Columbia, the Danish community in New Brunswick, the Icelandic community in Manitoba, and all of these various ethnicized uh, communities, many of them also landholding, not to mention First Nations, for crying out loud, are great repositories of stories that deserve to be seen and heard on stage, on, uh, 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 on, on screen, and so on. So what we really need is to throw off the shackles of globalization 
uh, which actually denude the imagination, which stripped the imagination bare in the name of a phony universality. The only universal that is true uh, is economics, is the flow of capital everywhere. That's the only thing that's universally true. And right along with it, what's also universally true is the oppression of various peoples as a result of, of uh, the marginalization of national economies uh, given uh, globalization today. Uh, so I think that part of the counterattack is in fact to invest deeply in the local. And I mean, we've seen this a little bit in, in discussions of the local city, for instance, or the locavore movement. I think people are instinctively moving back towards an understanding that the local, the regional, is where you really have to have your strong economy. It doesn't help you to have a strong national economy if you've got a weak regional economy, if you've got a weak municipal economy. You've got to invest in yourselves. You've got to invest in your downtown. You've got to invest in your suburbs. You've got to invest in where you are if you're going to have any kind of actual global reach, ultimately, that isn't simply Walmartization of everything. Um, so I'm sorry to get off into a little bit of a... Of a <laughs> a poem uh, and, and as a result of all this, so, so uh, a poem that's very personal, very local, uh, centered on my mother's uh, home community, Nova Scotia, Three Mile Plains, one of the historical black communities uh, in Nova Scotia, and, and uh, so this is a poem that was actually written in Amsterdam in a laundromat, uh, truly 31 years ago, uh, 1985, but anyway, and it's in my book, Wild Falls. Uh, and and uh, which is also stage play, but anyway, here it is. Uh, look homeward, exile. I can still see that soil crimson by butchered hog and brewed with rye, lye, and homely spirituals. Everybody must know. Still dream of folks who broke a crack like shale, pushed and twisted his hands in boxing. Morocco ran girls like dogs and got stabbed. Loved in her teeth decayed the black stumps. Her love making still in demand, spitting black phlegm. Her pension after twenty towns and tooth suckled on anger that no Baptist church could contain, who let wrinkled Ely seed her moist wound when she was just 13. And the tyrant son that reared from barbed wire spewed flame and charred the idiot crops to depression and hurt my granddaddy to bottom after bottom of sweet death, his dreams beaten to one tremendous pall till his heart seized, choked, his love gave out. But beauty survived, secret at the freight train snorting in their pins, and babes whose faces were coal black mirrors and strange drummers who stroke in and vandals hung the blind blues precise for a rich needlepoint, and in my love's dark orient skin that smelled like orange peels and tasted like rum. Good God, I remember my creator in the old ways. I sit in taverns and stare at my fists. I met earth into bread, spell water into wine. Still nothing warms my wintry exile. Neither prayers nor fine love, neither votes nor hard drink. For nothing heals those saints felled in green beds. By love or pain, a screw jammed in thick, straining wood. Thank you, gentlemen, and I'm honored to be sitting with you and all of them are convinced. If you want my opinion on the subject, come join us at the Grand Theatre on November 15th, 10 a.m. We are launching a press conference and I will give my response to the subject, to the city. Questions? Sir. Um, comment for, for you, Robert. Um, Sharon and I had the privilege to see Megan Coles ah. read this office. She is an incredibly powerful writer. Listen to her. I would love to see her work on, on the stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's she's amazing. She's something else. She uh, I can't I can't take credit for her, but I'll take credit for her. She uh, I did a, a residency with my company uh, about 10, 12 years ago and uh, threw it out to all the various students who wanted to go out to work and, and develop these over six, seven months. And I got this strange submission from this girl from her own land. Uh, you know, very frank. I, I don't write plays, I'm nothing about plays, but here's a short story girl. <laughs> And I just howled at the laughter, and it was just such fero ferocious anger in this work. And so I had never met her before. She was the only person in the submissions that I had never met, but I, I took her on. And she challenged me every second. Every time I gave her any piece of 
of advice, she would challenge me and fight with me. And, uh, and I wasn't quite sure if it was worth her time. I wasn't quite sure if the whole six months were worth her time. And then two years later, she called me and said, I just got to the National Theatre School. And when I encountered her, I was teaching at NTS, and I encountered her again. I was just blown away by how far she'd come. She's an incredible talent. And she, she uh, like myself, she, she dipped over into fiction, and is, uh, in many ways, her career as a fiction writer is really taking off much quicker than her career as a playwright, but she's mastered one of both points. Check her out. Uh, my question's for George Clark. Um, you have a denies the fact that we have been oppressive towards First Nations and Indigenous people, 
uh, denies the fact that we are elitist, hierarchical. And anybody who, who disbelieves this, pick up a copy of the Vertical Mosaic, which talks about how Canada is arranged in terms of class uh, and connection to ethnicity, language, race, and so forth. Uh, anybody who disbelieves this can just check incarceration rates right here in Ontario. Who are the populations that are most incarcerated right now here in Ontario? African Canadian, Indigenous Canadian. The most incarcerated in terms of our presence in the population. Right? So that also speaks to the fact that we have a hierarchical, elitist, racist, patriarchal, uh, and in many ways still sexist society. But we're blinded by all that because we talk about how bad America is, which sort of excuses us from having to recognize how oppressive we have been at times. And, and also it denies, our concentration on America denies our own cultural creativity. The linguistic creativity of the Canadian people, coast to coast to coast to coast, if you want to include the Arctic and the Great Lakes. All right, so uh, uh, this is a, a country with thousands of dialects. Uh, uh, Ian Pringle writes about this in a 1983 article. Uh, and, and, uh, and incredible lexicons. There's cowboy poetry out of Alberta, for crying out loud. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm saying it exists, right? And, and, and not to mention all those, all those fishermen's ditties and so forth out of South Shore, Nova Scotia, the Bay of Chaleur, New Brunswick, uh, and of course, Newfoundland, as we've already been talking. Not to mention West Coast fisheries, which were originally dominated by Japanese Canadians until the internment took place during the Second World War and the removal from the West Coast. But up until the 1940s, the West Coast fisheries was essentially Japanese Canadian. And what words may have come out of that experience that could be useful for poetry and for drama and so on. So we've got to stop demonizing America and start looking at ourselves critically, but also really mining, mining the richness of various heritages. And one last thing, we talk about multiculturalism and we, and we praise it and we salute it and so on. We do not actually inhabit it. We don't actually exploit it. We don't actually base our drama and our music and our poetry on the fact that we are the world's most multicultural nation and achieve more or less peacefully, more or less peacefully. We are the United Nations success story. For crying out loud, let's wake up and start and start pursuing that and singing about it and dramatizing it and celebrating it and critiquing it too. Yes, ma'am. Is that, can you all learn that from them? Thank you, thank you, George Robert. Thank you, George Robert.